we've had Roger with us before. You know, he did a great, great presentation for us um, back in, uh, gosh, I think it was in June, if I was, uh, if I remember correctly. Anyway, uh, earlier this year, uh, I think he had about uh, almost a thousand views on our uh, YouTube channel, and that was on uh, long haul uh, sporadic E, uh, which was, gosh, just a fa fabulous, fabulous. A program that's just, you know, been such a source of um, of reference for me uh, for a long time now. And so, uh, you know, today's is going to be about uh, F2 and uh, what all the elements are that go into it. And you know, it's not just the uh, not just the solar flux. So uh, Roger uh, has a long history of working in propagation. You know, he started out years ago working down in Antarctica, studying aurora, and um, he's um, he's uh, been a communications engineer for uh, many years and uh, quite active in all the clubs and publications uh, in uh, in Australia. You know, he's the he's the editor of a couple of publications uh, currently, and he's also worked for the um, Australian. Uh, space uh, Weather um, Bureau. So uh, he's uh, very well qualified uh, to give us this talk. And I'm looking forward to it. Factors influencing airflow, and I've added the little right. Good, thank you. As solar cycle 25 peaks. So let me give a bit of a roadmap. First of all, it's with our sun. I think almost everybody is uh, well aware of that. However, we get surprises from the solar cycles and the sun's influence on our ion. Winter is not always discontenting, just to sort of paraphrase William Shakespeare. Mindfulness. Path elevation and antennas. I'll cover the importance of azimuth and the opportunity from precursors. So, solar cycle. Are we there yet? Well, if you look at all the past solar cycles, there's uh, big ones and small ones and... Uh, a lot of people are saying, well, there's a bit of a trend going and it's all downwards. Maybe, maybe not. That's the bit about the sun. It has these surprises for us. So where are we at? This is the uh, International uh, Sunspot Progression from uh, the Royal Observatory of, of Belgium, which is a world data centre for solar uh, data. So on here you can see the smooth line and the monthly progression of uh, sunspot numbers as well as the daily. So the uh, the lighter, the yellow one is the daily, which of course is um, highly volatile, but even the monthly ones are volatile. The uh, the forecast there, the dashed lines, <laughs> there's two, one above the other, heading off to the right. Which one's going to transpire? So the solar minimum was in December 2019 with a smooth sunspot number of 1.8. Seems unbelievable. Now the 2024 forecast or April to July, this is from the Australian Space Weather Services, is from 142.9 to a bit over 147. So if we look at the table of what's been happening um, to date this year. The sunspot number has, uh, this is the smooth number, 
the observed number every month. So it's been climbing well above the forecast from May through to August. September, it may be uh, reviewed, but it was down. Where are we headed? Well, the observed su smooth sunspot numbers exceed forecast regularly, and it looks like that's going to continue. We may be going through the solar peak right now, or it might be yet to come. So here's another graph for you. Shows the comparison between the last solar cycles, SC24, and the current. So the, uh, the spiky chart is the monthly smooth sunspot number. And the main line, it pointed out there, is the smooth numbers smooth over 13 months. So we're, we're climbing well above where we were back in solar cycle 24. Now you note there are two humps. Maybe we're in for a second hump. Or maybe we're in the second hump. All good fun. So, as I said, the smooth number is well above that for solar cycle 24. So, here's the sun pumping up our ionosphere. Circulation is very important, as it is with us. Solar radiation drives the thermal tide, as you can see to the lower left there. So that expands the atmosphere and the ionisation in the ionosphere, in which travel away from the sun. And the magnetic equator is very important. The thermospheric winds from polar cap processes excite plasma waves with periods of 2, 5, 10 and 16 days, which um, wash through the atmosphere and the, and the ionosphere just to keep things moving. We also get gravity, or you might say buoyancy waves, from atmospheric shocks. That might be volcanic eruption. It might be a large thunderstorm. And these ripples travel up through and horizontally through the atmosphere, right through to the thermosphere, where we have the ionosphere. In other words, the ionosphere is blowing in the wind with acknowledgements to Bob Dylan. So season is a factor. The winter anomaly is your friend. Here we are. A recent graphic from uh, QST, uh, which is um, in fact a, a modeling of uh, an east-west path, 4,000 kilometer path, the F2 layer. We see the dashed line with arrows tells you when you when six metres is likely to be open. Now this is for a sunspot number of 100, the red line, and for mm, this, the minimum year, the blue line. So we're right in the middle of it. But this is the northern hemisphere. What about happens down here? Whoop, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. What happens when the when the uh, sunspot number goes above that 100 of the last graph? Shall we say to 180? Well, graph moves upwards or the, uh, the frequency bars move downwards. So you get a much wider opportunity with many more months. And here's the path. Now it's very important that it's a very low angle path. 
but are exaggerated for the purpose of illustration. So 4,000 kilometer paths, mid-latitudes, North American region. Path elevation is mm, tangential to uh, less than two degrees. We get more F2 layer ionization because there's more oxygen ions available relative to nitrogen, which are heavier, forms seasonal circulation in the ionosphere. As I said, circulation is important. With the solar cycle number, with these smooth sunspot numbers from 100 plus, six meter F2 may open between or over fall to uh, winter, early spring in, in your part of the world. Now it's also experienced in the mid-latitudes for the transatlantic or trans-Pacific areas. So what happens down under? Catch up with myself. Well, the curve sort of flips horizontally. And for the high solar, solar numbers we have at the moment, we get a wider opportunity, many more months, because our winter is in the middle of the year, June, July, August. So from late March through to early August, we get opportunities for F2 propagation at these sort of sunspot numbers. Here we are, MUF, 4,000 kilometer path in our region. Autumn fall runs over March to May, winter over June, July, August. Only a small overlap with North America. So late March, early April. So that's the opportunity for between hemisphere F2 propagation. Again, scales are exaggerated for the purpose of illustration. So what matters next is antenna elevation angles. Here's a couple of case studies I've done. The three element six meter Yagi mounted 10, meter or 10 meters off the ground on the left there. The, uh, the peak of the gain is at eight degrees. And typically for a three element Yagi is 14.5 dB isotropic. On the right, let me get rid of this in my way here. On the right, we have a, an eight element Yagi 20 meters above ground with a typical gain of 19 dBi. And the peak of the gain is at six degrees. So if you've got a lower elevation angle on the right path, you're working on the bottom of those first lobes. Keep that in mind. So six meter DX propagation paths are inherently low angle, for both F2 and sporadic E. Your antenna is working at the bottom of the first lobe. Now we get to the equatorial ionospheric anomaly. It's a bit of a mouthful. So this is what it looked like if you look at the electron density or the uh, vertical reflection frequencies, FOF2, for those that are familiar with it. You get this double peak either side of the geomagnetic equator, um, typically at plus or minus 20 degrees geomagnetic latitude. Now, ionization builds up either side of a geomagnetic equator because of <clears throat> the influence of the sun and the and the thermal tide. Can't see myself here. So it displays symmetry at the equinoxes. But 
further on. Now, this is what it looks like from a global perspective. So this shows equi equipotential um, yeah, equipotential lines of um, ionization in the ionosphere. <laughs> See that. <laughs> You can see the red ones where it show, shows the peaks. Now, this, of course, is not, this is a bit asymmetric, <clears throat> and it favours the favors the northern hemisphere. But nevertheless, um, you get a lot of opportunity arising from that. Solar radiation and the ionospheric convection maintain the latitudinal extent that you can see there. Production of the EIA follows the sun westward. So, <clears throat> still having trouble here with this. Right. So, we get trans equatorial propagation. This is, gives you opportunities for interhemisphere, as I said earlier. So here your typical trans-equatorial propagation that depends on the equatorial anomaly of those uh, peaks in density either side of the geomagnetic equator. This is afternoon type or super mode TEP. A caudal hot propagation path with ray path focusing which is an interesting phenomenon because that gives rise to um, gain <laughs> as you go through the ionosphere. North-south paths are typically 4,000 to 7,000 kilometres. Oblique paths, more than 10,000 kilometres. So here we are with ray path focusing. This, in fact, is a, a tracing of uh, a, a real measurement of uh, what was happening at the equatorial anomalies and what was happening with, with signals um, arising from uh, Seoul in Korea and uh, being received in Townsville. Although in this case, you said that the focusing on the right-hand side is a bit above the ground. Nevertheless, it does come to ground. I have personal experience of it. So this shows the focusing effect here. Now, I've had experience of this uh, working in Townsville at one time. The two local amateurs were sort of like a uh, an urban block apart, north and, north and south from one another. So in the northern shack, we could hear a really good a good signal and uh his friend in the in the shack one block to the south could not hear the signal and then it faded in the northern shack and rose in the southern shack so i could walk between the two shacks and follow the focusing, the focal point. Fascinating. So here we are with some paths. So we get, you know, oblique paths like that. Now we get to an interesting bit with longitudinal propagation using or exploiting the equatorial ionospheric anomaly. As you can recall from a few slides back, if you go for a, uh, a holiday in, uh, in Peru, 
you can work the Cook Islands. <laughs> you could certainly work Hawaii, and, and it's been known to work the Philippines from the US using this path. So, where are we so far? Our opportunities and experiences are controlled by the sun. Solar cycle 25 may be picking, or yet to do so. Winter winds are the winners. Ray path elevation is smaller than you think. Azimuth matters more than elevation. Development of the EIA brings opportunities. The equinox is a good neighbour. So as you go through the winter anomaly, close to the equinox, you might get some TEP. So are there any precursors? Uh, are they a factor? A number of people, you know, keep an eye on 28 megs. Well, here's an interesting chart. I have a friend in VK3 in Victoria, 1,000 kilometres, 1,200 kilometres south of here, who, um, who has a, a biostatic backscatter chirp radar and published the work in Dubas and, and in other places about how he's developed it. it. It just uses ordinary amateur transceiver, 50 watts, um, standard voice bandwidth, and he emits chirps and has digital processing of the return signals. Now, this one's interesting because he took this on the 15th of May, and he worked W3XS in Idaho at the same time. So this, of course, is well about that time now, actually, except we're in the, the opposite month. So this, this gives uh, a good idea of the condition of the F-layer, which is pretty good. So... That can come as a, as a good precursor because you get into a, a whispering gallery mode in the F layer, F2, because of some interesting mechanics. If the F1 layer is, a, is at a, an appropriate height and an appropriate density, it will turn the signal deflect the signal at a sufficient angle such that it, it enters the F2 peak at a very, very small angle and becomes a whispering gallery. Of course, it will exit um, at wherever there's a discontinuity. So the F1 layer deflects the ray path at a critical angle. Yep. Right, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Here we are. So with FOF1, which is, of course, the... Um, reflection frequency uh, directly vertical, but the FOF1 is between four and five megs, and the height of F1 at about 90% of the F2 layer, that it, it provides good conditions uh, to get this whispering gallery mode and around the world propagation. And here's a good way of predicting it. This is a mid-solar cycle, so probably a smooth solar cycle number of 80, 70 or 80. The little graph on the lower left represents the sort of angles you need to enter the 
F1 layer or the point that you, uh, you enter the F1 layer and that gives you the exit angles. That uh, the angle beta, it's very small as you can see, but uh, if you pick frequencies, you get these inverted parabolas. So that source altitude represents the F1 region. So you get a good, a, a good view of what happens. Those lower frequencies, you get. ATW, you get fewer opportunities because um, the right hand side there, 50 megs and 60 megs, because the angles need to be very much closer, very much smaller. So, primary factors went on the air. The solar flux index is your friend. SFI of 120 to 150. Oh, my spelling's gone off. Improving in most. As if I have 150 to 200, excellent MUFs. 200 to 300 is plan panned a bloody monium. Keep a close watch on the A and K indices. Low values, it was quiet time, so you can hunt and pounce. High values. Geomagnetic storms, return to your knitting. And to paraphrase an old musical ditty, tis the flux what gives the pleasure, but the flare is what brings the pain. Thank you. What are we doing? Excellent. There we are. So do we have questions for Roger? Yes, I'd like to ask a question. Please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? WA1SXK, Eric? Yes. Okay, uh, uh, hello, Roger. Thank you for your presentation here. Very good. Um, can I ask you, uh, do you have any information about the height of an antenna? Uh, I guess a, uh, well, an LFA four element beam. Do, did you didn't mention, but does the height, uh, I don't think you did, but the height of the antenna above the ground, does that affect the L, uh, the angle that you talk about? Look like in your graph, uh, working six meters, it was a little bit over four degrees was the best possibility of working six meters. Uh, uh, back to you, Roger. Um, yes, so uh, the, the, the height does matter, as I showed you in those um, two diagrams. Um, but even if you get it to uh, 50 metres, you only lower that lobe um, by another degree or so. It, that's Ground deflection uh, is your enemy here. If you can get a negative horizon, uh, which in fact uh, my friend with the with the chirp radar has with his receiving or his remote station, uh, he has a negative horizon for for uh, most directions. Um, that improves it, but it doesn't go down to zero. It it just means that um, you get a, a little further um, up the gain side of the uh, the first lobe. You're never going to um, do any better unless, of course, you do it from an aircraft at at uh, five or ten thousand kilometres. Okay, thank you very much, Roger. This is John or Yagi. Three limit, Yagi. Right, go ahead, John. Uh, thank you, Roger. Roger, I'm uh, in an HOA uh, issue, so I have attic antennas, and I will be installing uh, on a fan dipole, I will be installing six meters uh, at about 
18 meters, excuse me, I'm sorry, six meters above the ground, so about 18 feet. And what are your thoughts on the viability of that? Well, the, um, uh, well, it, it, it would be liable, providing the, the, uh, the signal, uh, signal path is really strong. And don't forget, if you, if you get focusing, uh, which is more common than, than we think, um, you get an improvement um, in signal strength. So don't, uh, don't despair. Uh, as as I uh, pointed out in that illustration, the three element Yagi tends above the ground. Um, my friend the K two FLR, unfortunately now a silent key. Um, he had it in a in a suburban house um, just uh, above his roof, so there was a lot of uh, nearby clutter. But nevertheless, um, he was uh, able to work. He managed to work um, uh, UK, Europe, um, and and uh, USA from there with uh, an antenna of not much gain and um, uh, barely uh, clearing his house. So it's uh, don't despair. You know, give it if if um, if you uh, if you work if you go on there you're likely to uh to work something all right thank you roger i have a similar question if i may um so i'm i'm kind of in a restricted area too in terms of we don't have a hoa but we have covenants and restrictions and i've i've been running a dx commander and in may i worked um, argentina uh, on six May sixth, I worked Argentina. Worked several Argentina stations. I think it was Ecuador as well. You know, the Argentina was six thousand miles, I believe, five or six thousand miles. Um, and um, I guess that was probably transequatorial. And I was wondering. I've read a lot of stuff about low angle radiation using a vertical, a ground a DX commander, actually. And it's supposed to be really good for that low angle radiation. And I was wondering if you had any comments on that. Uh, yes, that's uh, another way to um, uh, to go about it. Um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, ground reflection um, f from yeah in front of your antenna or in the direction of propagation uh, will still um, tilt up the, uh, the the gain profile, so it's um, you, know, you can model it, uh, and the models look really good. But when you uh, add reality in, um, it's uh, it's it's not so good as uh, you think. But nevertheless, um, you do get um, an advantage uh, with. Uh, Low angle, low angle vertical, you know, vertical with a ground plane. It's important that the vertical um, work against the ground plane, rather than what they, what uh, is often called end fed verticals. Okay, yeah, it's not an end fed because it's it's um, ground mounted radials, right? But but I guess uh, get well, it up see, the, the radios air is what are you're on, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, get it up in the air. Um, get it back in, in air. my early days. Uh, I'm talking. 50, yeah. I back in my early days uh, when first on the air as a teenager, I um, built a uh, three quarter wave vertical for six meters. Now this has two lobes. It has a high lobe and a, uh, a low angle lobe. And uh, that was very successful. I could work short skip sporadic E on the high lobe and uh, long distance stuff on the low lobe. And it, it was, um, uh, you're only getting, you know, one and a half 
db of gain, but it, it worked spectacularly well. And uh, I had a number of, of course, other people on the air who didn't believe it, but nevertheless, I proved that you can, you can do it and it works. So that's another thing to think of as a, as a three quarter wave rather than a, uh, a quarter wave vertical. That's what that's what I've got. Actually, I put a three quarter wave rather than a quarter wave on it. So it is three quarter wave. Oh, excellent. That um, well, uh, good luck with that. Worked a little bit. Hearing no further questions, Roger, thanks an awful lot for uh, another great and extremely timely presentation for us. Uh, a lot to digest there. And I'm glad we were able to overcome any technical um, issues um, and uh, take care of our internet propagation in order to get you uh, to our group tonight. We'll be uh, putting your uh, program on our YouTube channel and we'll let you know so you can link to it. So. With that, I'm going to thank Roger and wish everyone uh, a good evening. And uh, it sounds like it's time to go into six minutes. So, good hunting.